Welcome to part three of today's lecture. In the first two parts of today's lecture, we've explored economic and political incentives and the arguments for and against them. In this third part of today's lecture, which is going to be much briefer, we're going to explore the case for legal incentives, amnesties and exile. Before we get onto this though, I should say that the case for amnesties and exile depends somewhat on the case for international criminal prosecution that we're going to look at next week. If there's a strong case for international criminal prosecution, the case against offering amnesties, in particular international amnesties, will be weaker because we might think that it's important to prosecute under international law those who commit serious abuses. Now, in theory, an amnesty could have extremely beneficial consequences. It could lead to a peaceful transition rather than the leader hanging on to the bitter end. And indeed, it does seem that sometimes amnesties and exile have worked. So, for instance, Charles Taylor received exile in Nigeria after his role in mass atrocities in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Charles Taylor was a particularly brutal rebel leader, responsible for um, extreme harms committed to populations. Idi Amin, another brutal dictator, mass atrocities committed in Uganda in the 1970s. He went into exile in Saudi Arabia and lived out the rest of his years after he was opposed, um, de deposed after he attacked Tanzania. As I said a few weeks ago, the possibility, a few, uh, as I said earlier, sorry, a few, uh, the, uh, earlier in today's lecture, possibility of exile was being widely muted for Bashir al-Assad as a means of achieving regime change and ending conflict in Syria. Another interesting case is this. In the eve of the 2003 war in Iraq, it wasn't only the generals that were offered bribes not to fight. Saddam Hussein and other leading officials were offered the possibility of exile in Bahrain if they st stepped down. If Saddam had have accepted, it could have saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, thousands of Americans, hundreds of British soldiers who otherwise who, who end up tragically dying. And of course, could have saved Saddam Hussein's own life as well. So the case for amnesties seems intuitively attractive. And it's clearest when it's offered by a new government ready to transition to peace towards the end of conflict. Offering amnesties can give rebel groups or government leaders a clear reason to stop fighting. They're not going to be prosecuted. Imagine if one were to offer, would have offered Donald Trump an amnesty saying he wouldn't be prosecuted potentially for um, various things that he might be prosecuted for. Uh, it's not very good. But we're going to focus more specifically on the case for international amnesties. Are these permissible? International amnesties. So these are amnesties that are offered by other states or international bodies not to prosecute them under international law or they are the offers of international forms of exile. And we're also going to focus not on amnesties and exile for those further down the ranks, but on amnesties and exile for leading figures where it can really make a bigger difference. It simply might not be possible to prosecute everyone and might not be possible to offer everyone um, and then they have to, so they have to be offered an amnesty for feasibility reasons. What we're really interested in is where it would be potentially possible to prosecute someone and you decide not to, offering that incentive. So we've seen the case for, seems intuitively that it could work, could save thousands of people's lives. And our focus is going to be on the international amnesties of leading figures. <laughs> 
let's now look at the case against offering legal amnesties and exile. In part two, we saw that economic and political incentives can be problematic to the extent that they reward evil, reward wrongdoers, giving them a benefit that they don't deserve, and to the extent that they lead to moral hazards, corruption, um, and undermine intrinsic motivation. Legal incentives can also have all of these effects as well. Amnesties, exile can have these effects. But there are additional further problems that you might think that amnesties and exile have. Firstly, if you agree with the various rationales for the International Criminal Court and the justifications for international criminal justice more generally that we're going to look at next week, the use of amnesties and exile seems very problematic. For instance, offering immunity may undermine any potential deterrent effect that such systems have by showing that if a leader abuses their population, they can still get away with it. They're not necessarily going to be punished. It might also appear to condone the behavior. So think about when we've looked at the various international norms about condemning the behavior. If you're offering an amnesty or an exile, you might appear to condone the behavior that's gone on. And it might be thought that it's very important to condemn, criticize, sanction the behavior, maintain international norms in the longer, longer term against aggression about R2P, for instance. So these are the main reasons against offering amnesties and exile. Firstly, they suffer the same objections that those that have faced political and economic incentives. Secondly, they may undermine any potential deterrent effect of international criminal justice that we're going to look at next week. And thirdly, they may fail to express moral outrage. Still, though, you might think that it's acceptable sometimes to offer beneficial, to offer an amnesty simply because the beneficial consequences would outweigh these, these potential problems. So you might think that if Saddam Hussein had have accepted the offer of exile, this would have been all things considered justified, despite these potential objections to legal amnesties, uh, to amnesties and to exile. One issue here, though, is that, particularly with dictators, is that human rights abuses often continue even without the presence of the dictator. So even if you offer them an amnesty and an act, they receive exile, there might still be significant mass atrocities. Uganda, Idi Amin, went off to Saudi Arabia, but Uganda continues to experience severe mass atrocities afterwards and a very bloody civil war. It wasn't for almost a decade or so that it started to um, become more peaceful and the um, number of um, human rights abuses went down significantly, although not fully down. Exile, what about the possibility of exile? Well, one further concern here is that exile isn't really feasible often. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, the offer of exile needs to be a, by a state that, as we will see, has not ratified what's called the Rome Statute. That's the founding agreement of the International Criminal Court. If the state has, it would be duty bound to arrest the leader if the ICC issues an arrest warrant. Even if it did not plan on doing so, a leader is highly unlikely to seek exile in one of the signatory states of the International Criminal Court, given the risk that they could be transferred to The Hague and tried. Given that there are 120 or so states, parties to the Rome Statute, there aren't many states that leaders can actually, in fact, now seek exile. So it makes it much harder for leaders to be down to um, find a state where they could seek exile. Secondly, and this again um, relates to next week, the rise in international criminal justice has meant that leaders will probably be much more skeptical about exile agreements being upheld. 
So I mentioned Charles Taylor here. Charles Taylor did receive exile in the 1990s, but since then, he has been, there's been subject to an issue for his arrest in Nigeria, and he's later been tried um, by the special court of Sierra Leone and extradited and imprisoned. And this was a significant precedent, one might think, for leaders. You think, well, they might be offered exile, have a de facto amnesty, but in the future, they might still be subject to international criminal prosecution. This case, it might be thought, in particular, has reinforced the sense that exile is illusionary. One interesting case happened very recently in the Gambia. I've been Equatorial Guinea, starting a new life in exile a day after relinquishing power. Jame was persuaded to hand over power to Adama Barrow, who defeated him in an election last month by the regional group ECOWAS. Jame went uh, to Equatorial Guinea via Guinea. The long-time ruler refused to step down after December 1 vote in which opposition leader Adama Barrow was declared the winner, triggering weeks of tension as West African leaders threatened to use military force to ask Gambia's former president Yahya Jame if he failed to step down. But the crisis is now over. Jame boarded a small unmarked plane at an airport in the capital Banjul late yesterday alongside Guinea's president Alpha Conde after two days of negotiations over a departure deal. The departure of Jame, who took power in a 1994 coup, paves the way for the transfer of power to Barrow, who was sworn in as a leader at the Gambian embassy in Senegal on Thursday. Barrow is now expected to return home. The president Adama Barrow. We met President Adama Baro, who hopes to go back as quickly as possible to Banjul. But our strategy is to first secure Banjul and the whole country before President Adama Baro can be installed. So that's an interesting case of um, a brutal dictator, very authoritarian leader, re very recently, though, agreed to have exile. Okay, this brings to an end today's lecture. We've seen in the first part of today's lecture what incentives are, the various types of incentives, how we should understand them, and the case for economic and political incentives. In the second part of today's lecture, we explored four major objections to economic incentives, economic and political incentives, including that they might lead to moral hazard, that they reward wrongdoing, corrupt society, and crowd out intrinsic motivation. In this third part of today's lecture, we've explored legal incentives in the forms of amnesties and exiles, could see that some of the arguments for and against them and see how they relate to next week's lecture. Next week's lecture then is going to follow directly on this and is the case for international criminal prosecutions.